Okay. Um, so we're we're going to start into a series of discussions of, of reverse phase liquid chromatography now, and there'll be two lectures on what I would call the practice of RPLC, and then there'll be a discussion of why it works. So this is very phenomenological. I'm not going to the talking theory here at all, but it, it's, it's like organic chemistry. There are certain facts that you have to know in order to do reverse phase chromatography. And so I'm going to be throwing a lot of facts and factoids at you. Um, so we'll start off with a, with a big picture. Let me get my pen working for the big picture. And we'll talk a bit about the kinds of reverse phase columns that are out there. And then we'll talk about solute structural effects on retention. What changes we make in a molecule will it increase or decrease retention? You have to have some idea of what's going to happen. You have to have some idea of when things are going to come out of a column relative to one another. Um, and then we'll talk about the mobile phase effects. The mobile phases are typically water with an organic co-solvent. That co-solvent is called an organic modifier. How much of the modifier do you need to add? What happens if you add more modifier? What happens if you change the modifier from methanol to acetonitrile to tetrahydrofurane? What does that do to retention? What does it do to relative retention? Um, another extremely important effect is pH. Since, since the mobile phase almost always has water in it, the pH of that mobile phase is really critically important for any molecule that can undergo ionization. And the vast majority of all biological molecules, perhaps with the exception of carbohydrates and some lipids, but even phospholipids ionize, um, they're all pH-sensitive molecules. Their retention is going to vary, sometimes a lot, with the pH of the mobile phase. So you have to understand pH effects in reverse phase chromatography. In normal phase chromatography, you're using hexane as the mobile phase. What's the pH of hexane? God only knows. Um, another factor, uh, not as big a deal in reverse phase or in liquid chromatography as in GC is temperature. But temperature definitely has an effect on retention and relative retention in reverse phase chromatography. Uh, temperature also has an effect on plate count because temperature impacts the viscosity of the mobile phase, it impacts the diffusion coefficients of the solutes. So it is an important variable. And most HPLC systems can, uh, tolerate temperatures from room temperature on up to 80, 90 degrees centigrade. They're made to go up to maybe 80 or 90. Um, there's, there's what we call mobile phase additive effects. Um, this is when we deliberately add a low concentration of something to the mobile phase to change, specifically change retention of some of the species, not necessarily all of the species. Um, we'll talk a lot about what we call ion interaction agents. Some people call them ion pairing agents. We'll talk about what happens if you add micelles to the mobile phase and cyclodextrins just as examples. And then we'll get into a discussion of silanophilic effects. That is the residual SiOH groups, the ones that are still there, even though you attempted to get rid of them by end capping, they're still there. They will impact the chromatography of certain molecules. Maybe not everything, but certain molecules. <coughs> as far as I was able to find out, the very first paper 
is on reverse phase chromatography, goes back to 1948, and what these people did is they took filter paper and they impregnated it with vulcanized rubber. Now, paper is polar, but if you put rubber in it, rubber is a, a natural polymer that is fairly nonpolar. Um, they dried it, they rinsed it with methanol and, and acetone. Um, it, there was a lot of rubber in there, and the rubber behaved as the stationary phase, and they were able to separate fatty acid esters between the rubber phase and a mobile phase that contained a mixture of methanol or methanol and acetone uh, in one-to-one -one mixture. And they separated the molecules with the larger fatty acid esters coming out after the smaller fatty acid esters, which is typical of what goes on even on a modern C18 based silica reverse phase material. <clears throat> not too many papers back then, and not a whole lot happened. This, this doesn't mean there was no chromatography going on. It means it was all normal phase, or it was all ion exchange. And then HPLC happened, and some guys got a bright idea of how to make really good silonized silica gels for doing reverse phase chromatography, and the world changed. So even though the stationary phase may be a solid, what you really want to do is think about that solid, especially if it's got a C18 bonded to it. Is you want to think of that C18 group as like a liquid, a monolayer of liquid. And what's, what's happening is that very much like what would happen if you had a beaker full of water and hexane and you threw in some solute molecule, that solute molecule would distribute itself between the water and the hexane phase depending on its relative solubility in the water versus its relative solubility in the hexane. If, if the solute liked the hexane, the nonpolar phase, a lot, then it would stay in the stationary phase a long time and it would come out later than a molecule that preferred the water phase. So I want you to really think about this as a partitioning process of the analytes between the mobile phase, which is pretty polar, water-like, and a stationary phase, which is very nonpolar, hexane-like, or hexadecane-like. Here's a nice reverse phase chromatogram of a bunch of amino acids. You can see it does a nice job of separating this wad of amino acids. Amino acids are really fairly polar molecules, aren't they? They got a carboxylate at one end, they got an amino at the other, and they got some, some functional group which could be phenyl or methyl or it could be another base, or it could be a carboxylate group. They're, they're fairly polar molecules, yet we're able to separate them by reverse phase chromatography. Um, this, this is a C18 column. That's a fairly nonpolar stationary phase. Here's a bunch of water-soluble vitamins. If you look at, look at the names of these compounds, there's ascorbic acid, that's very water-soluble. Um, folic acid, water-soluble. Nice chromatography. Here's some peptides. Um, oxytoxin up to angiotensin. Beautiful peaks. These are big molecules. Here's some bigger molecules. Robonuclease, bovine serum albumin, that, that's got a molecular weight of about 67,000. Uh, insulin's 
kind of puny. It's only about 3,700. Uh, ovalbumin is about 30,000. You can separate proteins, amino acids, fatty acids. You can separate all sorts of things by reverse phage chromatography. Just to remind us, we're talking about this stuff where the surface of this has been silenized appropriately with a low polarity ligand, something like C8 or C18 or phenyl. Thirty years ago, I never thought it would get to this point. But there's 650 different reverse phases currently available on the market. Some of them are interchangeable, but they all aren't interchangeable. Um, we're now in the third generation of reverse phase materials. And I'll, I'll talk about some of this as we go through here. It's important that you understand that these materials <coughs> have changed rather radically since they were introduced 30 years ago. Because some of the methods, analytical methods developed 30 years ago, are still being used, especially in the pharmaceutical industry. And if a method's been developed for a generation one type material, it's not going to work very well on a generation three type material. And there's really no point in trying to make it work. Third generation. Ultra pure silica, that means very, very low metal content of the silica. The first generation, they didn't pay too much attention to how much metal was in there. Now we really care. They have figured out how to do the silenization so that from batch to batch to batch, there is a very high degree of reproducibility in the retentions. In the early days, what people did is they bought a bunch of columns from one batch. They tried to anticipate five years worth of columns and they bought that many columns. Or they reserved columns and said we'll buy these columns but we, we got to be able to get 50 of them next year and 50 of the next year and 50 of the next year. Anymore that's not an issue. They know how to make them very reproducibly. The bonding chemistry has gotten a lot more stable. They've, we've figured out how ways to improve the stability versus pH at low pH and high pH. Um, they're now highly base deactivated. That goes back to the SIOH residuals. We know how to get rid of I don't, the really bad ones. I'm not saying we get rid of all of them, but we can get rid of the really bad ones now. We know how to get phases with a maximum degree of hydrophobicity, which means the most retention for your compounds. And there's all kinds of phases with this slight and sometimes big differences in this polar selectivity. bad news is that there is not one reverse phase column that can solve all of the separation problems. You have to marry the column to the problem. Or the type of column, type of column to the type of problem. This one's short because it, it was part of the preceding lecture in one hour. So I'm going to move on to the next, which is this one. So what, what I mean by a reverse phase product line is if you take, if you pick a manufacturer, like Waters or Sepelco or Agilent or ResTech or Phenomenex, just, just to name a couple. They have a product line. What's the ver what, what are the factors that influence the, the differences in the behavior? 
the pore size of the silica, 60, 120, 200, 300 angstrom silicas, almost everybody has got that range in pores that you can buy. <coughs> the particle size, 1.8 microns, 3, 5, 10, 15, 20, and then the so-called core shell materials which have the solid inner core and the, the porous layer on the outside and the monoliths, the silica monoliths, uh, that's really only merc. What kind of bonding chemistry do they have? Um, is C1. C1 means three methyl groups. C, the C number refers to the chain length of the alkyl groups that are on the stationary phase. Not the number of alkyl groups, but the chain length. So C1, C4, C8, C18, C30. These are all fairly common. Cyano, phenyl. Uh, PEG phase means a polar embedded group phase. I don't think uh, I'm going to have to scratch it out here. Here's a typical polar embedded group. This is an amide group that's in the middle of the chain. The chain might be C12 long, it might be C18 long, but putting that there changes the properties of the stationary phase. <clears throat> in some cases, it improves the chromatography for polar compounds. The polar compounds, some of them can find those residual SiOH groups. By putting a polar group in here, the silane might be able to bend over, and the silanol group would interact with this amide group, and it would, it would prevent your analyte molecule from getting to that silanol group, and it makes the, the peak shape for your analyte better. Um, there are other, other functional groups used here. Carbamates have been used. Ethers have been used. Um, I can't think of any other polar functional groups that they, they put in the middle of the molecule. They have a number of highly fluorinated stationary phases that I mentioned the perfluorophenol before. Um, the bonding chemistries, whether it's n capped or non n capped, sometimes, sometimes you actually want that interaction with the surface OH group to give you just a different degree of retention to get the molecules that you want separated. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Uh, polar embedded phases and what, what are called aqueous compatible phases. If you try to do reverse phase chromatography with 100% water, no organic modifier, it is possible that the water will not wet the stationary phase at all. If it doesn't wet it, it won't go into the pores and you'll see the most miserable peaks you've ever seen in your life. So sometimes they deliberately make a phase so that it will wet with 100% water. That phase is not going to be real hydrophobic because it's wet by water. So obviously it's not really hydrophobic. So there's a trade-off if you go to one of these phases that, that will work with 100% water. And the phases have should have minimal metal content. Um, what those parameters influence and are influenced by are the hydrophobicity, which depends on the surface area, the bonding type, and the bonding chemistry. Um, the silanol activity depends upon the bonding chemistry and whether or not it's end-capped. 
there is actually shape selectivity. The stationary phases will recognize differences in stereoisomers, whether something's orthometapara, whether it's cis-trans, whether it's a diastereomer, um, and that depends upon the bonding chemistry. The polar selectivity depends on the bonding chemistry. The metal content of the stationary phase depends upon how the silica is manufactured and how pure the reagents are that you make the silica from. So, this is a rendering of what a C8 end cap phase looks like. Here's the dimethyl octal, single bond, right? single SiO Si bond to the surface. Here's our end capping group, three methyl groups. It, it's still, if, if you were to put this over here, it would bump into that, and you just can't get. You just can't get that one covered. It's still there. Remember, as I said before, you're going to get a little bit more, even on a very highly silenized phase, you're going to get a little bit more than four micromoles of this stuff total. And you've got eight micromoles of those to start with. So they're still there. If your analyte can get real close to it, it's got to interact with it, and that's going to impact the selectivity and the retention of that analyte that gets that can interact with the SiOH group. <coughs> this is this is a, a picture from the old days where people were using silanes like that the trichloro octadecal silane, this stuff polymerizes and it formed the web over the entry to the pore. And diffusion in and out of there could be quite slow. And these materials didn't give nearly the plate counts that we expect to get these days. But they're still made because people developed assays and they don't want to change the assay. So if you're looking up a paper and, they, and you want to do exactly what they did, you need to know what kind of stationary phase they made it out of. Now fortunately that information is available at, at, a, at a website which I'll tell you about later on. Um, <clears throat> there's all kinds of materials out here. We've been talking mainly about the silica based C18, C8. However, you can take various metal oxides like zirconia and alumina oxide and coat the pores with a polymer. And you use a nonpolar polymer like polybutadiene and you got a nice reverse phase material. Here's a, a phenyl silane. Um, there's a methyl group there, sometimes there's three methyl groups, sometimes they put six methyl groups and then a phenyl. You have to know what you're working with. Um, this is an interesting material. This is what's called a PRP, a polymer reverse phase. There's no metal oxide, there's no silica. You take, you take polystyrene divinyl benzene and you cross-link the bejesus out of it and you build in some pores and that will act as a very nice reverse phase. The beautiful thing about this stuff is you can take this down to pH 1, you can take it up to pH 14, it's stable. In my opinion, nobody has ever figured out how to really make this stuff with good mass transfer properties. The plate counts are not that good but the stuff is enormously stable. Now I started off by telling you to think about this as, as your molecule partitioning between water and hexane. This is a little better 
a way to think about things. Here's, here's your bonded phase attached to the surface. Yes, you've got your siloam groups embedded in there. Here's your mobile phase out here. This is a mixture of water and methanol. Your solute molecules are going to distribute themselves somehow between this, this mobile phase. And keep in mind the mobile phase occupies a lot of the space in the pore as well as the space outside the particle. And, and it partitions between the two phases. So does the mobile phase. Um, the methanol is green. Those are green. The water is blue. Those are blue. There is some water that associates itself with the stationary phase. Probably most of the water is around these silanol groups. The methanol, acetonitrile, THF, probably more associated with the organic ligands. There is absolutely no question that a certain amount of the mobile phase actually sorbs, mixes into the bonded phase ligands. We know that to a certainty. Okay. We're, we're now getting into the guts of this, the solute effects on retention. Log K prime versus number of carbons in a homolog series. Here's three homolog series. Alkyl benzenes, alkyl phenones, if you don't know what phenones are, and phenyl alcohols. Straight line, Martin equation, same as in gas chromatography. It even goes the same way as gas chromatography. For completely different reasons, it goes the same way as gas chromatography. You add a CH2 group, the stuff wants to get out of the polar mobile phase and go into the non-polar stationary phase more and more and more. The more CH2 groups you add to it. This is real data, so the slopes are not quite exactly the same. But log of K prime, which means the log of the free energy, is linear with the number of CH2 groups in the homolog series. Does it or does it not make sense that the alkyl benzenes are going to be more retained than the phenyl alcohols. The only difference is that. This is certainly going to like water better than a methyl group will like water. So in fact, there is a pretty big difference in retention. That's about a half, that's about the limit. So it's a log two. That's, that's, that's a big difference in retention. This is less polar than that, but it's not as nonpolar as a methyl group. So this makes perfect sense. As the solute becomes more polar, it likes water better, it's going to be less retained. The higher the water solubility of the analyte, the less it is retained. That's a good bet. It's very important that you know what functional groups enhance 
water's molecular solubility, uh, the mole molecular solubility of water, and what functional groups decrease water solubility, because these are going to tell you what that functional group is going to do to the retention. Let's consider these related compounds. Okay, there's benzoic acid that's ionized. So we're adding a COO minus group. Water and charges, water dissolves salt. Hexane doesn't dissolve salt. This is going to be a lot less retained <coughs> than this closely related molecule. The OH group is a very good hydrogen bond donor, and it's a very good hydrogen bond acceptor. So it's got two things going for it to make it like water. It's a donor and an acceptor. Water is a donor and an acceptor. Nitrobenzene, that's a fairly good acceptor, but it's got no donor capability. So. I have not done this on all 650 commercial stationary phases, but I'll bet there are very, very few of them that this is not less retained than that. There's benzene, and then there's toluene. You add a CH3 group to toluene, you've made it less polar. Right, you add a CH3 group to benzene, you get toluene, you've made it less polar. This is certainly going to be more retained than benzene. It will be, I guarantee, on every reverse phase stationary phase of going. Another kind of weirdly interesting thing is the more, more branched it is, the less retained it is. Not a lot, but you can separate tert-butyl benzene from sec-butyl benzene from n-butyl benzene on most reverse phases. <clears throat> okay, the more nonpolar content you have in the molecule, the more it's going to be retained. If you add a CH3 or a CH2 or a phenyl group or a chloro group or a bromo group or an iodo group, these are all relatively nonpolar functional groups. You're going to have a significant increase in retention. <clears throat> There's a slight decrease in retention if you, if you transform a sigma bond into a pi bond. Because the pi bond is more polarizable, water is dipolar, it's going to polarize it more. So it's going to be slightly more water soluble than is the saturated molecule. If you add a functional group like cyano or nitro, sulfoxy, amido, as a polar functional group, you're going you're gonna to decrease retention. <clears throat> if you add a functional group which is a really good hydrogen bond acceptor, like OH or COOH, you're going to decrease retention a lot. If you then ionize that, you're going to see a further big decrease in retention because ionic species are much more water-soluble than non-ionic compounds. I'm sure you have all attempted to dissolve benzoic acid in water. If you haven't, you were cheated in your organic chemistry lab. It's hard to dissolve benzoic acid in water. You add a drop of sodium hydroxide, it dissolves. You get a huge decrease in retention if you add an ionic group. Branching, I just showed you, decreases retention slightly. So tert butyl is more branched than sec butyl and so on. Um, you're from pharmacy. Uh, yeah, uh, pharmacology. Pharmacology. You know about KOWs? Octanol water partition coefficient? Oh, yeah. 
I guess we we'll talk about as lipid partition. Yeah, the well, same thing. Same thing. Okay. There's a very close relationship between log p, which is log kow, uh, which is extremely important in pharmaceutical science and very important in environmental science for for pollutant transport and log K prime in reverse phase chromatography. In fact, if you plot log KOW and log K prime, there's a fairly good linear relationship. There's a, there's a lot of scatter, but there's a fairly good linear relationship. Anything that, that makes something partition better into octanol out of water Generally, any functional group that does that will cause an increase in retention. Fortunately, this stuff is so important that people have set about ways of measuring it and, and quantifying it and built physical organic chemistry models. So if we take the, log, the ratio of the log of the KOW, and they, I don't know why they don't call it KOW, they call it P of some compound with a functional group X over the compound where X is just hydrogen. That's equal to rho, a constant depending upon the solvent system. Rho is 1 for water octanol partitioning times the parameter pi, which depends upon the functional group X. So we can change the solvent, that will change rho, but it doesn't change pi. We can change pi, the functional group, that doesn't change rho. Okay, so this varies with the functional group. This is the basis for a huge body of work called quantitative structure activity relationships, which predicts the efficacy of drugs and quantitative structure retention relationships which predicts retention in various kinds of chromatography. We can use the same pi factor for both. Now, this is, these are numbers from a huge amount of work done by um, Hansch and Leo. And th this is just a minor, itty bitty fragment of this enormous table. This tells you what happens if you add these functional groups to a molecule? If you add these functional groups to an aliphatic molecule, that is, you're, you're adding it to the aliphatic part of the molecule, CH3, CH2, CH, and C all give an increment of pi value of 0 0.5. It's a positive value. That means that it encourages the extraction out of water into the less polar octanol phase. And this is a log 10 scale. So that's a half order of magnitude increase in the transfer into the octanol phase. That's a factor of three. If you put the same functional group onto an aromatic ring, it's a factor of 0.56. Notice Chloro group increases retention, bromo increases retention, iodo increases retention into the octanol phase, into the stationary phase. Put an OH group on it and wham, you have an order of magnitude decrease in retention, decrease in partitioning into the octanol, an order of magnitude. There's a carboxylate group that's not ionized, minus 0.67. Uh, I know they have the number for the ionized group. I just didn't look it up. So this is, this is how we can predict what functional groups will do to retention. So for instance, if I have one drug and I put a methyl group on it, I can predict fairly easily um, uh, almost to a certainty that that addition of a methyl group or an iota group or a bromo group is going to cause an increase in retention of the, the, the methylated molecule. Why does fluorine 
Increase. Damn if I know. Right. It's real. Uh, and it's very interesting. Fluorine is used in a lot of drugs. Mm -hmm. Fluor Fluorbiprofen is a modified ibuprofen. I don't know why. It, I'm not a farm. You're, you're in the pharmacy school. Yeah. But fluorine does matter. You change a hydrogen to a fluorine, it does matter. Antidepressants, fluoxetine, um, mm -hmm. for There's a lot of them. Ones, yeah. Same with these statins as well. For solubility reasons, I just didn't know that it... Oh, and it's not just for solubility it, reasons. It, it changes the activity of the drug. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it, it is different in aliphatic and aromatic. I mean, I'm uh, sorry. That, that's, a, that's definitely different. And this is not measured with one compound. These guys measured these numbers with tens, twenty compounds. Unfortunately, it's not simple. And there's all kinds of correction factors that are applied. Uh, you don't need to worry about this stuff. It's just, it'll just drive you crazy. Fortunately, there are computer programs that do this. And I just pulled out a couple of free ones. There's something called, you can Google Instant JChem or Google ICD Labs, that's Automated Chemical Development. They, you can download the software to do it. <coughs> there's, there's many, many, many approaches to these predictions. This is a relatively recent paper that, that compared six different ways of estimating log P. Some of these are quantum mechanical methods, some of them are just based on fragment constants. Um, there's the, the scatter, if you plot one estimate versus the other, the scatter is awesome. This is not a perfect world. But these numbers are valuable because they point you at least in the right direction. Here's some of the plots. This is log, that's log. That's, that's a lot of scatter. That's a half order of magnitude scatter. So you have to take some of this with a, a grain of salt. That's functional group effects. Now we move into organic modifier effects on retention. The first and most important thing is that as you add organic to the aqueous mobile phase, retention goes down. Log K prime, there's volume fraction of organic goes down. Almost a straight line. I call it quasi-linear. Um, Lloyd Snyder uses this equation so much that I, I've named it the Snyder equation. Um, this says that the log k prime is a linear function of the volume fraction of organic modifier in the mobile phase. This is the intercept up here when you go to 100% water. Well, that's 30% that's methanol. 100% water is still further out. These different molecules don't all have the same slope. There's tert-butylbenzene, there's isopropyl, there's toluene, there's benzene. The order is exactly what you would expect. The more CH2 groups, CH3 groups that a molecule has, the more retained it's going to be. And the greater the slope of this line is, so the bigger and the more nonpolar the molecule is, the more sensitive it is to change in the mobile phase composition. <clears throat> the slopes that you see here are about 3 to 5. Benzene has a slope, well this is log 10. So benzene is about 3, the tert benzene is about 5. You go to a big peptide slope will be 20. 
That means there's a 20 order of magnitude change in this retention factor when you go from 100% water to pure organic solvent. 20 orders of magnitude. That's a lot. Go to a polystyrene of molecular weight, 50,000. The slope is enormous. Here's a comparison of acetonitrile and THF. Um, this is acetophenone, butanophenone, hexanophenone. You can see the hexano is up here, the aceto is down there. The slope gets bigger the more methyl groups are in the molecule. You can see that <coughs> THF slope is bigger than the acetonitrile slope, and the methanol slope is smaller. I don't have it here than the acetonitrile slope. So as we increase the percent organic, you get a decrease in retention roughly linearly, quasi-linearly, of the common modifiers, THF is stronger than acetonitrile is stronger than methanol. Is that true for every solute? No. If a solute really likes to accept hydrogen bonds, methanol could be a stronger solvent than THF. For purely nonpolar molecules, this order is pretty, pretty accurate. Here's a comparison of the three solvents for 20 monofunctionalized benzene. So it's benzene, toluene, chlorobenzene, bromobenzene, nitrobenzene, methoxybenzene, acetyl, acetophenone, uh, phenol, stuff like that. 20 small molecules. Average them all together for a given solvent. And you see that the, the methanol, the slope is lower than for acetonitrile and the slope for THF is greater than for acetonitrile. So this is the weaker solvent overall. This is the stronger solvent overall, right? So the slope is indicative of the strength of the solvent. Of the solvent. The bigger the slope, the stronger the solvent. This is a very important slide. Here's five different simple molecules. This is log K prime versus volume fraction of methanol. What happens right there? Can you separate those two molecules? Not that fraction. Not at that volume fraction. Can separate them there. Can separate them there. Except this is hardly going to be retained at all. You're going to see these crossovers. It's going to happen. This is a very simple mixture. There's only five compounds in there, and there's only one crossover. But there's nothing to prevent this from having multiple crossovers, which means that. When you're developing a method, you got to hunt for the region in this space that maximizes the resolution of the compounds. You hope. This is one of the major tools of method development in reverse phase chromatography, the hunt for the right mobile phase composition. The hunt for the right organic modifier, because methanol is going to be different than aceto, it's going to be different than THF. Yes? I forgot, I'm sorry. Here's another way to show you the same data I've been showing you. Here's a bunch of compounds, 80% methanol. 
change it by 10%. They move out. They all move out. They may not all move out the same amount, but they all move out. Change it to 60%, they all move out better. More. Roughly speaking, for these molecules, which are not very big, molecular weight 200, 300, something like that, you're looking at about a factor of 2 in K prime per 10% methanol. That's factor of 2 in K prime. Not retention, because retention has the dead time built in. But K prime has the dead time taken out. So it's a factor of 2 in K prime, roughly speaking. It's a little more than that for acetonitrile, it's more than that for THF. Let me go back. Look at this THF plot. All these compounds are normalized to 100% in, in pure water. Here's THF. That's one order, two orders, three orders, four orders of magnitude for going from 100% water to 70% THF. Four orders of magnitude. That's a lot. You've got a little more than two orders of magnitude change for methanol. So THF is substantially stronger than methanol for the average of those 20 compounds. Yes, right. Is this for a constant mobile phase composition? This is the mobile phase composition. That's the mobile phase composition. It's, that's 80%, that's 70%, that's 60%. So it wouldn't be a gradient elution. It would be no, it's an isocratic elution. This is in 80% methanol. This is in 60% methanol. Now that may not impress you, but this should. This is what happens if you change the composition by 1%. What this means is if, you, if your pump or you change your composition by 1%, there's a very substantial change in retention. It's way more than 1%. It's not going to be reproducible from day to day. If you set your data system up and you say, I want you to integrate from there to there, from that time to that time, and the next day, you screw up your mobile phase, or your pump screws up your mobile phase, it's going to be integrating a wrong peak. And these are small molecules. These are not peptides. This is a very serious problem. Can, is, can it be solved? Yes, by careful work it can be solved. By getting good pumps it can be solved. By making your mobile <laughs> phases up gravimetrically, by weighing the water and weighing the solvent, you can get incredible reproducibility. Uh, this is a good place to quit because it's a somewhat different topic.